Today, after a little break, we are talking again to Christian Spanik. Hello, welcome in the new year. Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, so at the first show, we actually talked about you writing books. And last time we spoke mm -hmm. with Han Ru Hannes Rükheimer and you writing books and making TV shows, courses mm -hmm. for people. So let's talk a bit about your time at Data Becker. How was it for you? Uh, it was a funny situation because um, the way I, I came to Data Becker was I was working, uh, working as a copywriter on an advertising agency in Düsseldorf. And we wrote computer books, which I did besides my normal job. And um, so when I was uh, thinking about uh, books I wanted to write, one of the things was um, the Amiga book. And um, there was the uh, Amiga for beginners. And the funny thing was that um, I, I wrote the book and I wanted to have some kind of celebration of, of the starting of this book. And I think I told you last time it wasn't too easy to, to make Dr. Becker publish uh, an Amiga book. It was a different reason because Dr. Becker was, for all, uh, was very, very strong believing in the Atari and not so much in the Amiga. But after I persuaded him to, to, to publish the Amiga book um, and it was published, I had the idea of an event. And so I, I did quite a lot of things. You can read it on my, on my website on digisauria.de. Uh, I did quite a lot of things to bring the people from Commodore and the t uh, people from Data Becker together in the Data Becker store, which they had down, downsize, uh, down, downstairs, and um, make a kind of, of, of publishing party for the book. And the best thing was they brought the first five Amigas, which were sold in Germany, to Data Becker, and they were sold at Data Becker. So it was a big Amiga happening. So this is important because um, after this thing, Dr. Becker asked me, so you made a great job on this event. And what do you think? Wouldn't you like to, to work at Data Becker? And I said, OK, which kind of position? What should I do? I mean, I'm, I'm working for Data Becker as an author. And he said, oh, um, what about being assistant to me or personal assistant to Dr. Becker? And I said, oh, yeah, that's a cool idea. And um, so I thought about it and uh, came to the point to say, yes, I'm changing. So I was leaving the advertising company, Team BBDO, and was switching to Data Becker as assistant to Dr. Becker. And so I started working at, at Data Becker because of this one Amiga event. <laughs> okay. And from when to when did you work for Data Becker? Well, I don't. I really don't know exactly the years anymore. It was about a, a, li a little bit more than uh, one and a half years, about. Um, and I started um, with uh, doing quite a lot of things to help Dr. Becker m make things um, work. Whatever it was, it was from from discussing with customers um, to writing for the catalog, the Data Becker catalog. Uh, it was also having ideas for the shop. Um, having ideas for uh, new concepts on books and things like that. So it was quite a big amount of, of things. And one of the things I did was um, to uh, um, be in charge of the um, foreign language books. So um, Data Becker books were started publishing in United States, in France, in, in Holland, in different countries in the world. And I was in charge of... of um, doing uh, the, the deals, the work with those guys in those different countries where sometimes Data Becker sent me to France or to, to Great Britain to have a look at the stores there and to, to check if they really um, not only publish the books, they also are good in distributing the books and all that stuff. So it was quite a long time I had and it was an interesting time because a lot of, of, of uh, later very important uh, connections came because I was working at Data Becker. I was always connected with a lot of people, people at uh, Data Becker from the uh, time as author, but it was different when you were suddenly a part of the team. So um, Rainer Bartel, who is still writing with me together at uh, Digisauria, was one of the guys, he was uh, editor-in-chief of the Data World. 
um, or um, um, uh, Klaus Wagner, who was uh, the in, in charge for the book program. Brigitte Witzer later on was in charge for the book program. Quite a lot of people I met, uh, which I um, some of them I still have contact with. And I learned a lot about the difference being one of the clients as author working with Tata Becker, but not being in Data Becker and the other way around, suddenly I was in Data Becker and was discussing with authors about their books, about their ideas and all those stuff. So it was a very big change for me in the perspective of how to see, uh, a, a, yeah, a, a kind of a funny, I, I don't know, you can't say it, wa it wasn't a publishing house normal. It was, it was a very special thing because th they did software, um, they did um, sometimes they did hardware, they did uh, books, I mean, and they had a shop down, downstairs. Uh, there was quite a lot of interesting people like uh, Garrett's and English uh, and all those guys. It was really interesting and was really a big variety of things Data Becker did and we could do at Data Becker. Data Becker was famous, at least in the 90s, for their software like um, the big business card printing studio and so on. And it's quite mm -hmm. interesting because there's also Mark and Technic that actually stopped um, computer books and said they would um, mm -hmm. concentrate in home improvement books. And last year they actually switched back to computer books and now are copying mm -hmm. data backers um, business card print software and other software data backer did. <laughs> So it must have been quite successful now that Mark and Technic is actually copying what Data Becker did back in the days. I mean, I don't know if they're really copying it because it, things have changed so much. I, perhaps they they um, are inspired by the ideas from from Data Becker that years ago. Um, I mean, what what Data Becker always did was. Um, when, when I met Dr. Becker first time, it was at the Frankfurt Book Fair, one of those seldom situations where he was at the Frankfurt Book Fair. He never went to the Frankfurt Book Fair again because he said, where well, I can't sell books to clients, I don't go there. So um, um, in that time, you, for example, on, on CBIT, um, you, you could sell your books. Uh, I mean, you can really make a shop and people were stopping by and buying books and it was a crazy time of buying books because people bought, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five books to, I don't know, Norton Commander or something like that. So it was a different time and Dr. Becker always thought about how can I refinance that uh, the money I f invest to go to the fair. And so Frankfurt Book Fair, because it was not allowed to sell books there, um, was not a good place for him. But the one time he was there, we met and we were discussing because we did a book which call, was called at, uh, at that time at Vogel Verlag, at Chip, which was called Peak Poke, which was a very small print um, imprint of um, the best addresses for the Commodore 64. And, you know, all those peaks and pokes you need to make things happen at the 64. And um, Dr. Becker, because you talked about uh, taking an idea from somebody else, saw that book wanted to hire us. We didn't want to go to Data Becker for different reasons at the time. And uh, he decided to make a book like that, which was also called uh, the Peak and Poke book for the C64. It was not so successful like ours was, but he was also let himself be inspired by something else. So I think it's not such a big deal doing things like that. I mean, surely we as, as authors were not amused that they did a a, a book which was somehow a competitor to ours. But on the other hand, I mean, ideas are free and, and people can do things like that. So what I think what was uh, Markton Technik, because I didn't know what you just uh, told me about Markton Technik. What I think is what Markton Technik rethought was the idea of how do people um, work with computers if they are not computer freaks. And Dr. Becker had had two souls in his heart. One soul was he was a really freak. I mean, he, he went to US, um, he saw all those computer things coming up, met his first computer people, came back and said, hey, we have to do something about that. Mm -hmm. And so he asked his father, because you remember Data Becker was um, situated in Autobecker, means 
a, a car dealer. Um, his father was a big car dealer. And uh, so Dr. Becker um, persuaded his father to give him some, some spare place in the car house to make a computer store. And then he started to um, to publish books which were they were printed on on needle printers i mean can you imagine to print a book from 400 500 si uh, pages on a needle printer which is beep, 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 and it goes for hours and days but that's what he did and and this was his success he just started because he was a freak by itself so the first things like 64 internal or 64 in 10 was a book which was for freaks um and then um, he found out there's a different group of people which are not so freaky, but they want to use computers. And so he started to give them ideas of doing things on a computer. Uh, and one of the first things was beginner's books. So it was a 64 for beginners, things like that. But after a while, it was clearly that they said, we have to, to bring the people some software which makes or, or help them to be productive with the computer. And so because of those two souls Dr. Becker has in his heart. I think because of that, he was doing a very great job at that time. And I'm quite sure if you look at the, at the computer industry and the digitizing industry now, you see the same thing. There are people who are really d digging into all that stuff, but there are also people who just want to use it and need some software and some su useful things. If it works, doing, um, doing again software to, to sell, I don't know. Um, if you look at, at Microsoft or other software companies, they, they don't really sell the software in, in, in a special way. They sell a license or, or they, they give away the software and you have to, to pay for other things like WordPress, things like that. So I don't know if it works, um, but um, the idea is give people a reason to use your computer for clever things. And I think this is a good idea. So you spent more traveling more than writing for data backer, actually. As I said, you went to a part a lot. Yeah. What was your most yeah. I mean, um, uh, reminding situation you had abroad? I mean, a lot of people say that data backer went down because they um, tried to be on the international market no, 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 no. no. Um, Data Packer was very, very successful. Uh, it was also very successful on the international market. Abacus, for example, did all the books in in, in US and things like that. So no, they 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 didn't went down um, um, during during trying to expand. I think um, before talking about the what was perhaps reasons for, for data packer going down. And um, to be honest, I was not with them when they were went down. I, I was there in the big, great, good times. <laughs> um, but there's one thing which is important. And because you asked me about what is the biggest thing you have still in your mind, it's quite a lot of little movements we had. But there's one thing which is really interesting was Dr. Becker always was thinking about better times before. <laughs> when, when we published a book and it was going really good and we were doing, I don't know, 15,000, 20,000 copies in a short time, he always told you, yeah, but you know, when we started with 64 internal, uh, we did uh, 50,000 in half the time. Um, so he was always thinking about a better time before. And I think the reality, and it's not only data backer, it's uh, because wanting down with business, uh, it was also market technique and, and Cybex and, and name it. I mean, there were quite a lot. The reason for wanting down for all the companies was that they were simply obsolete after a while. Because, I mean, it was a time where more and more people published things somehow about computers. Um, just look at the at the computer um, 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 uh, magazines. It's the same problem. Wh why are they, most of them are simply away? I mean, remember in, I don't know, 15 years ago, you went in a, in a, in a, in a magazine store on, on, the, on, the, um, on the train station 
and you had a whole bunch of, of titles about computers, different things. So now just have a look at it now. Or just went to the bookstores where you bought your books about computers, just went to them now. And even if you just remember the last, I don't know, 15 years, you see those numbers went down and down because we were simply obsolete. I mean, it's the same thing with people often ask me, why don't you do a, a new computer show on, on ZDF or RD or I don't know, some, some classical TV station. And why do you do it on, on internet? I say, because there is no reason of doing it again on a classical TV station. Because people search for information and they get it through the internet. So they don't wait for a time when on Monday evening, uh, 7 o'clock, a uh, noisy computer show is starting again. It's the same with the information about how to do something. And if you, if you search a problem from anything on your computer, I mean, you don't go to a bookstore or you don't go to a, to a, to a, to a train station bookstore um, for magazines. You you'd simply Google it, you search in the net for things, or perhaps you go to a youth group or a, a Facebook group who is discussing those things. So what I mean is, it was not a going down because of having bad ideas, of doing something wrong. It was just simply all those things were going bit for bit obsolete and we trained the people to n to use all those things better and better so after a while they surely came to the point saying if i use this internet really good i don't need a book anymore because on the net the best thing is most of the things are actual um on the book it's a question, is it actual or is it the, the reprinting or the printing before the last version of the software? And this was one of the big problems also. We had a simple problem in, 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 in running on, on the systems. Um, uh, I'm, I remember when, when a new Word version from Microsoft came out, or a new Office version from Microsoft, uh, we were trying to get the pre-version as soon as we could, the beta versions, to give it to our authors and to give them the chance to have a book ready when the product was launching. But you and I know that a beta version of a program can slightly or more change to the final version. And so suddenly it could happen that you were there with the book, the book was selling, but there were bugs in the book because you had a version which was not a real one the, uh, the, the user now buys. So this was one of the reasons, I think, what, we've, what we found out, books are too slow. They are not fast enough. The book market is not fast enough for all those things. And so I think that the reason for um, all of those publishing houses were going out of business where sales were going down because people didn't simply need it anymore. And this was a, a clearly thing. This was why I went away from TV on, on that special part. I mean, I'm still working for TV, mm -hmm. but in a different role on different shows, which has nothing to do with IT. Um, but um, on, the, on the IT shows, I had the feeling in the end of the, of the 19th, beginning of the, uh, of the 2000 years, I had the feeling, who the heck will still step into a noisy computer show if he can just watch something on YouTube. I mean, it was so clearly what was coming up um, that I didn't believe in the future of a show like that anymore. And I mean, even if noise was still running, it was changing so such a lot. It was going away from the classical computer theme, it was going more to the social themes, what does it mean for society and all those things. And this was the time when noise was successful again, but it was a completely different story than it was when, when I did it. Interesting. <clears throat> so which market approach was the most successful? Was there something like a language barrier? Barrier? Not really. I mean, we. Uh, mo uh, I mean, America was very successful. Um, France was relatively. Um, um, so, it was. It was the English market was sure the biggest one because of the simple point that if you get have have a book in English, you can sell it in quite a lot of countries, and so the English 
English part of the of the um, of the books was always the most successful, um, and there was not a big difference that days, because um, every market worked similarly. I mean, people simply wanted uh, a book to the new version of something, or that time also to a new hardware. I mean, just think about. When did you saw the last last uh, book about, let's say, um, the Celeron processor or a Celeron PC? That There's no book like that. <laughs> yeah, but but um, you, you you I'm quite sure you haven't found one because the last big hardware things, except of Amiga and Atari and things like that, uh, from the home computer market, the le last big hardware news, which were um, um, producing books, because there was a demand for books, was something like the um, 386 and the 486, <laughs> and, you know, and, and then it stopped. We, we did books to the new compact version, uh, to a new compact hardware, a new compact PC in, in the early days. Nobody will now buy a book to a PC anymore. And there's another very important point from my point of view. This was one of the reasons why I went uh, to to um, to video more. Like you remember, perhaps the uh, so series like uh, Neues der Anwender course, which was how to make things. Um, why I stopped writing books or um, did less and less books was because what we have, what we what we what we got after a while was a graphical user interfaces. And believe me, it's relatively hard to write a book about a graphical interface because you have to say, and now you take the, um, the third, uh, third thing from the menu and click on it. Okay, great. But then perhaps you remember Microsoft did things and other ones did also that the menus could be um, made tailor made for by yourself. You could change the menu. You could say, "Now I, I want this um, this menu point because it's more important than that menu point." And suddenly, your word looks very different to my word. So, in a book, I had to tell you, um, "Please go to the original version because without that, we I can't tell you." People didn't want to do that. So it was a first big gap between the things we could do with words and people could see. So um, the other thing was the more and more it was, was graphical, uh, like icons and, and things like that. It was al already a problem on the Amiga was uh, to say, take that icon. And the more programs came out, and uh, just remember in the beginning of Amiga days, there wasn't so much software. There was some games. Um, there was deluxe paint <laughs> and, and deluxe music and things like that. So it was a relatively s little group of icons you had on your desktop. But just now think how many icons you have on your desktop. So it was clear that writing was more and more a problem for telling people how to use a computer because computer was used graphically and so people wanted to watch something. This was one of the reasons why we did this video series um, you can could buy uh, where we also put some books with it um, so there was a, a, a YHS cassette with, with the video and there was a book with it. But most of people just watched the video and said, ah, that's what he meant. So this is also a reason why printed um, things were somehow in trouble for the marketplace. But um, you mentioned at the beginning that Databack also published abroad. But not always. I mean, for example, there was this uh, synthesizer composer program called Synthemat 64 mm. in English, but it came with a German book as a manual. <clears throat> and they worked together with Hesware in the USA to make an American English version. Mm -hmm. And Hesware was actually I known mean, for Hesmon, yeah. which was uh, one of the most used assembler monitor in USA for the Commodore 64. Mm. I, I can't say so much things about the software because this was a part why I had very less to do okay. with. Um, but um, what's really true is uh, Datapack always was searching for, um, for um, 
partners in different countries which were doing all that stuff like translating and, and make it uh, right for the marketplace. Which sometimes brought us to very interesting discussions about what does a program need to be successful in a different country. Um, and the other thing is, what was really sometimes very complicated is, we got the software from different people who were writing code. But um, when you remember the days, programming that days, was not meant or was not originally easy for translating it to a different language because the words are longer and shorter and just take a menu bar where you have um, eight columns and in Germany all the things are longer. You get in trouble with that. And this sometimes um, because of the way of how people program things was not so easy. So we needed really partners who were able to solve that problem um, just to get the whole thing done. And uh, I don't know if, if you remember or if you know that, but in the first versions of, of Word, uh, of Microsoft, you get an English manual and you get an English version. And it was hard, also on the Amiga, the first uh, word processing software, you didn't have the German umlaut things and things like that because it was American driven. So this was a real big problem for um, bringing software from one country to another country um, because computers were, first of all, not so friendly to um, help you make them working in a different country because of language problems and different other things also. So I think um, it took several years before people, programming people, had in mind that there might be a chance that this software also will be published in a different country. And then they started to make things different, programming it different, that it was easier to, to change that. But isn't that also a disadvantage? Because things get lost by translation. But what do you mean with will something get lost? I mean, especially lost on, on the books, Hannes is a typical um, phrase. <laughs> yeah, but, but you know, um, <coughs> The point is, if, if you take a normal classical computer how-to book that days, um, there was not too much was, was, uh, could be lost in translation because it was simply do this, do that, do that. I mean, this was not a big deal of, um, of writing culture <laughs> in it. So if you, if you take a, a novel by, uh, I don't know, uh, Jonathan Franzen, and you translate it to German, or you take a novel from, I don't know, um, some German writer and translate it to English, you always will lose some things, and it depends on the, on the translator, how he manages um, to, to make things work in this other language, perhaps changing several parts of words or even sentences. Um, this was not a problem in computer books. Perhaps with mine more and Hannes, because we did a lot of, of gags um, in the books, which are only working in Germany. I mean, there was quite a lot of, bag, uh, of gags, which you, you simply can't translate. And we had several times people calling me up and say, hey, um, translators, what do you mean with that? I, I didn't heard that expression up before. So um, you see, um, there were some books where you perhaps get some um, lost in translation, but what is true is, um, if you wrote a book about a software from, I don't know, US, um, and you wrote the book, you had normally in the first month only the English version of the software. So you did not know how will they call the menu in German. Or you perhaps did not know if they all do a German version at all. Um, I don't know, Deluxe Paint, I, th I think, was long time uh, on the Amiga was long time only in English. And so we just use the English words um, that you, you go to menu and then you click uh, pencil and not pencil and all that stuff, you know. So um, I think there was not a big problem except you wrote the book to a software and you wrote it on the English version because it was the available version. And then after three months, you got the German version and all the people get the German version and you have a wrong book. This was pain in the ass. 
but normally it was not a big deal. And on the other hand, you don't have to forget in that days you didn't get a new version every five days because somebody did a patch day or update over the internet. You get a version of Word and only if there was a real big problem you get some update diskettes or things like that. Normally, if you have a version of Word, um, there was not a big deal with updating on, on that because you worked with it for a year and then the next version came out and you bought it again or graded up or whatever. So, um, so it was not so, so a fast change like we have now in software. <coughs> Do you have some examples of books that were successful translated on other markets from Germany? Yeah, I mean, we had, <coughs> what, what I'm quite sure is uh, we were very successful with the Amiga books because there was not, in, all in most of the countries, there were not a big market for Amiga. Um, so a lot of publishing houses didn't look at the Amiga books at all. Um, and so we had a good deal with the Amiga books. It does, didn't work like that on the, on the um, MS-DOS books or on the Windows books because this was a big market and every market has had its own authors in the market, the made the book there. So um, the translation market, market after a while changed to an original market. And because of the uh, publishing houses on software, although we're publishing um, um, uh, after a while um, programs in both languages or in all languages, um, you at least had a German version, an English version, a French version, and then it depends on um, which markets they w wanted to address. Um, you had suddenly the situation that you had the same version in the um, in all the countries, um, and then then after a while you get a German version for Germany and an English version for for English market and the one. So um, the author in England could do the same like we did he wrote simply his book he didn't have to wait for the translation for the translation of a german book so in the beginning the tr translation market and the foreign market was interesting for us because we were very fast with our books which was data back and also marked and technique um this changed um after a while this was they they did their own books and the their own books were more successful so I can tell you that the Amiga books was very successful in the US. Um, I can tell you that the MS-DOS books weren't successful in the US, f coming from Germany, I mean. Um, um, so it depends on how, how strong the market was in that special um, topic um, in the home market. Okay, I see. But not a lot of them, I guess, reached fame status. I mean, there were like, you know, people like Jim Butterfield, who is one of the most mm. um, famous authors of um, introduction videos and books from the USA. Yeah. But I guess most book authors, people never, <laughs> never heard of. Yeah, but you know, this was a completely, I mean, what we had that time, we had different ways of making let's say products or 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 ideas with computers there were there was a market with all those pre opening for example all the cracking guys who were cracking software did some opening things <laughs> some uh, three-dimensional multi i don't know sound graphics things opening so when you started a cracked version of i don't know deluxe paint you first get a kind of intro which was not done by the people <laughs> at electronic art it was done by the guy who cracked it and what they did is they made a kind of of um yeah uh, it was a contest who did on the smallest amount of space in the computer the most imp i don't know imploding exploding hammer thing opening t a part with sounds and graphics and things like that so it was a kind of competition um, between all those guys. Sometimes, um, and after a while, there was a kind of, we, 
we didn't care about a correct version. We just wanted to see what kind of of mini. I, I don't know, I, you, it was like a video. It was sound and it was graphics and it was uh, with a lot of colors and, and animations and things like that. It was like, like a video. And after a while, we just collected cracked versions because of the intros, <laughs> because we had already the software. <laughs> I mean, I by myself bought every software, but all the other ones, we just had fun on looking on those intros. It was a special part for a while where we were really astonished what c people can do with a f really few lines of code, but a very clever idea of how to use in the hardware. It was, was great. It was completely different. And so um, you find book authors who did se special things. You find um, authors of software who did special things. You find people who just did little things. So it was really, it was an enormous wide landscape where you could, could do things. Nobody asked you, what do you use it for, or why is it useful? You just did it because you could do it, and that's it. So when was the point you left Databacker, and why? It's a, it was not about that Databacker was um, losing market shares or things like that. It was still a great time we had, and It was not about um, money or things like that. It was a completely different thing. I had uh, I, I had a partner there, a, a guy I did a lot of and still work together with him, Joachim Fette. And he and me, we had some sometimes ideas. For example, we had the idea um, to go to the um, Frankfurt Book Fair again, because of different reasons, because of the foreign markets, because of some things we thought we could do there, which could be good for Dr. Becker. And um, Dr. Becker had a very clear idea of what he wanted to do and what he didn't want to do. And he sometimes had a very harsh way of telling you that. And so, for example, when we came again and said, hey, we had an idea for, for being on the Frankfurt Book Fair and doing that and that. He didn't really listen to us. He said, so guys, you know, if you really just want to have some great days in Frankfurt, just tell me, I send you there, you have some good days, we We, we, go, we send you to a hotel with a great spa and a great wellness area. You have some great days in Frankfurt, then you come back, um, and that's it. And this gave us an idea that he thought that we did this for our own sake, but that was not the idea. We just wanted to try out things. And, and so if, if that happens to you sometimes... You came to the point where you say, "I, I think I would, I would do it different." But the question is, are you right or not? Is he right? Are you right? Um, and so, um, after a while, I had the idea of doing things different on quite a lot of points, like how does book publishing change? How does things change? Um, and what does it mean for the job I'm doing? And since I'm working, I'm always seeking for new ideas to, to help me tell people stories, because, because that's what I do. I'm a, a storyteller. I was it from the beginning on, from school days, and I'm still. But I was always searching for the impact of new technology on the way of how to make things. And so, like when, when I stopped with the TV thing, it was because I had the feeling, I told you before, um, I had the feeling there is an end. It, it, you have to go out to be more helpful than you can be when you're still in that station, in the TV station. And the same thing was with Startup Becker. I went to Dr. Becker and said, you know what, I think from now on, I know the company now very well. I, I learned quite a lot of things here. 
And I think I gave some good input. And we did some good things together. But now I think I'm more useful for Data Backup being out of the company than still being in the company. Um, and he agreed on that idea because he found out that uh, because I was constantly changing things and, and arguing or, or asking if that's right or if you can do it different or things like that, that I also did something which was not so clever for having a bigger company. I brought permanently uh, questioning in the company. A kind of I was constantly disturbing um, all the people who were just doing their job because I said, hey, this is a good idea, but couldn't we do it different? For example, one day, I, I, I had a flat near Data Becker. And when I came um, by um, from, from home to, to work, I always went uh, by all the uh, Data Becker windows, um, the shopping windows. And almost every week I went by there, hey, we should do something like this here. Or, oh, this is still the same old shopping window. We should change it. Um, because I was so full of, uh, yeah, ideas and enthusiasm and... and, and and power to make things. And so after a while, um, yeah, I was disturbing the people. And um, the longer it goes, the more he had to deal with me, discussing everything and, and thinking about, can we do it different? And the people say, hey, we should now simply be able to do our job without permanently asking us if we can do it different. So you, you see, or I hope I could make clear what it was. I was, sure. I was, too much a person with permanently changing things, permanently thinking about different ways to be a good person in a company. So my idea was not to go to a different company. My idea was making a business on my own. And so I, I went to Dr. Beck and said, you know what? I will do, I will start my own business. Uh, I will not go to a different publishing house. I had different um, houses which asked me to, to come to them or things like that. I, said, I, I won't do that. I want to do a business by my own. I want to make books and I want to make different things like uh, moving pictures, uh, TV, things like that. And so we went different ways with uh, a lot of respect for each other and in good mood. It was not, not hard words. Um, and I was trying to find out if, I, if I, I do things like I like to do things, if it works. And by myself, I, I had, we earned some money with the books. And I had some ideas of what I can do uh, on my own business. And so the situation was that I said, okay, even if it doesn't work, I have enough money to survive a year. And if it doesn't work, because I find out that my way of doing it is not working at all, I have to go back, be an uh, employee of somebody, go back to a publishing house or go back to an advertising agency. And then I tried it. If it doesn't work, I can always say I have tried it and my way of working on my own business didn't work. But like you know and other people know, it worked. And so I started my own business, and so that's one of the reasons why I'm now sitting here. <laughs> <coughs> so do you think publishing could have been saved? I mean, now we have the Kindle, for example, and e-books, mm -hmm. which is very successful, I think. Let's put it that way. It depends on what you publish. For example, I mean, everything is clear when you're talking about a big... Um, picture book about New York or uh, the Sahara or something like that. That's not a Kindle product <laughs> uh, because it doesn't work on a Kindle. If you use, um, for example, a book which um, tells you like a, a, a travel book, um, you go to Südtirol and you take a little travel book with you to tell you what are the big places in Südtirol, what is uh, what are very good food and all that stuff. That's not a Kindle product. Um, this was a classical book and is still somehow for a lot of people a classical book. So if you just read uh, 
a, no, uh, a novel or a, 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 a book from Stephen King or from uh, don't know one of all those authors which just telling you novels and then you are great with a Kindle because especially in my age you know you can make the the tube a little bit bigger <laughs> and it's it's uh, you, it had its own light so you uh, if you're in a hotel room and I'm still a lot of traveling um, and w which has no good lights you can still read it very well uh, so a Kindle is a great thing for novels and for classical info books without too much graphic stuff if you have all that with you you are better off with a tablet or your smartphone so um, publishing itself will not go away it will still stay, but the question is, has it to be on paper or can it be on something else or perhaps even can it be better on something else? So the question is not if publishing has a future. The question is if the thing you want to do has the perfect technology to bring it to the people. If you have a story to tell and you have the perfect technology for it, it will be successful. If you have no story to tell, you have perfect technology. It will not be successful. And if you have a perfect story, but you put it on the wrong technology, it doesn't work. So that's my feeling. So do you think if in the end, paper books will die out? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I believe I will not, I think, I will not um, be alive if it's if all those paper books will be away. I think it's long, it's a while after my death. So I don't know how old I will be, uh. but uh, I will get, but um, I think, um, no, I don't think that paper books sh will simply disappear. There's no reason for it. Um, but what really is, you will see an acceleration of the change and you, you even see it now. For example, I started with e-book reading because of my mother who is now more than 80. Because she, when she was 70, she came to me and said, hey, you were at the Frankfurt Book Fair. Um, they, everybody was talking there about, and that's the, her, her or original pronunciation, was talking about the epoch. And I thought, what? Yeah, everybody is talking about the epoch. And what she meant was an e-book. And she thought, hey, I want to have something like that because um, you can change the, the, the typo. <laughs> you have a small, very light device because a book, if you have a, a big uh, novel, it's, it's, if you're an older person, it's hard to hold. It's really because you hold a book for a long time, you don't think about it. But if you're more than 60 or 17 years old, you will find out, whoa. So, so an, an e-book is much lighter. Uh, even if it doesn't care if you have a 1,000 pages novel or a 100 pages novel. And my father liked the idea of my mother having e-books because when they were traveling in, uh, on holidays uh, to, to Tunisia, uh, <laughs> it, my mother always took away a lot of books because she was reading a lot. So he always had a, 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 a whole uh, um, um, Suitcase. Uh, part of the luggage only full with books. <laughs> and so he was really a fan of the idea my mother taking away a small little thing ebook which is able to do all the good things she likes and also just make all those books he had to bring to the airplane <laughs> to the hotel just disappear so i don't think that um ebooks e will simply replace books i think quite a lot of technologies will replace books and as long there are people who say my e ideal form of reading is on paper they can do it and there will be a market perhaps books will be much more expensive than now perhaps uh, uh, a paper book will be suddenly about 100 bucks or something like that because people say hey we only print 500 of those perhaps you go back to the old days where a book only was published because you had subscribers for it. I don't know if you know that, but in the old days you had to subscribe a book and then it, they were publishing it. So if there were more than 200 subscribers for that book, then they published it as long as they were less than 200. They won't publish it. So, you know, perhaps we come back to some different stories, but simply disappear, I don't think so. And now we have print on demand. <laughs> yeah, which is a complete different story because this happens 
because of two reasons. First of all, the only way of printing books a normal publishing house won't print was making your own books. And so it was a print-on-demand thing. So you said somebody told his story of his life. And the only persons who are interested in that will be about 500 people, his friends, his family, and all things like that. So you, he couldn't go to a normal publishing house. So the first of all were those publishing houses who are doing small amounts of things where you have to pay money um, that they publish your book. Not only you have to write it, you have to pay money for it. And then they come print on demand where you can say, hey, you know what? You write your book and if you sell 20 copies or 200 copies, we don't care because we don't have to publish it. But all the people who want to have it can print on demand and get it then. So it's your turn how many books you sell. But And the second reason, a third reason was because I want to be published. I want to be on paper. <laughs> I mean, I had that in a different way. So um, I was never um, be in the problem of thinking about books on demand or print on demand. And now you have all those um, electronic books and you can publish if you want. You just have to do it. It's, it's, it's an open standard. So things have changed um, uh, quite a lot, even for authors. And self-publishing market is a big market with a lot of potential and a lot of uh, very senseless books and a lot of very good books. So it's like a normal book market also. Great. Thanks for taking the time and sharing your stories. Wonderful. You're very welcome. Next time we should talk about CBIT maybe. Now that CBIT is also history. <laughs> It is. If you like. Yeah, sure. So let's okay. make a new date for talking about CBIT. Perhaps um, in the, in the uh, uh, let's say, in the, in the harvest also, uh, in the last part of, of this year, because then we also survived these new things. Because, I mean, I don't know how it, it feels having a year without CBIT at all. I mean, I, I had the chance of finding out that it is March and I'm not in Hanover. <laughs> So, because then it was in summer, in June. But now I have the first year, don't have a CBIT at all. So I will find out how it feels, and then I will talk to you again about that. You can you can go to the um, CES in the USA. Uh, CES in the USA. I was at the CES. Um, I know the CES, and perhaps you saw I I just did a, a video on on our YouTube channel from Desauria about the history of Comdex and CES and how all those things were. Um, it's not a question of having a fair about technology and things like that. There are quite a lot of fairs out there. It's uh, about special, like like uh, the ERR in Frankfurt, the uh, car fair, is a, a fair about technology and IT and digitalization. Um, the Frankfurt Book Fair itself is a fair about digitalization and changes. So. Um, the only point was that CBIT was a special place for me and, and I was there from the first one on. So um, when it was not the CBIT itself, when it only was a, a hall at the Hannover Messe. So, you know, it's a different thing. It's like a little bit when they said we stopped CBIT, it was a little bit like, like uh, uh, losing a, a, a relative. Wow. Well, thanks for taking the time. Time is up. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah talk to you next time thank you very much for being in time again great <laughs> do you have a big watch in front of you that no, always see how I, have to use, I, I said <laughs> okay so best wishes to your viewers thanks for having me on the show again thank and you. looking forward to talk to you in the end of the year about CBIT or whatever okay, okay thank you bye okay, thank you bye bye, -bye.